All right, everybody, welcome back to Therapist Uncut. I'm Nikki Young. I am here with my fabulous co host, Alyssa Nehara. And we were so excited to have Natalie Silva join us a while back that we asked her to come join us again. So here we are with Natalie. We're very excited to have you today. And not only did we want to bring you back, like your episode got lots of traction with our listeners. It was very relatable. We had great feedback. So if you guys haven't heard it yet, please go back and listen to Surviving Mom Guilt with Ms. Natalie Silva. Thanks for having me back, guys. I had so much fun last time. I'm here to have some more. Sweet. So what are we talking about today? Talking about body image and self-esteem. And we're going to touch a little bit on how COVID has impacted self-esteem. It's all the fun stuff. All the fun stuff. All the fun stuff. All the great, (laughs) uncomfortable things. So before we move forward with body image and self-esteem, if our listeners have not heard about you yet, can you let them know a little bit about who you are professionally, who Natalie Silva is personally? My name is Natalie Silva. I run a private practice um, that's all across the state of California. I do telehealth so I can see anybody who resides in the state of California. And I specialize in women's mental health and maternal mental health. I'm a single mom. I have a four-year-old daughter. Welcome to the Therapist Uncut Podcast, where off-the-clock therapists who happen to be friends share their uncensored thoughts about real life. Join us weekly in spreading positivity and making mental health relatable through casual conversation, inspirational stories, and real talk with friends who happen to be therapists. We really are excited because, as usual, Nikki and I, I feel like, can very personally relate as well to the topics that we bring. So I would like all of y'all to think about what kind of body image issues or thoughts were going on in your head over the last 18 months. What does it feel like now that we are, and we did an entire episode on quote, reintegrating into life and being in person. But what's it like for you now kind of having to show up in person to places that you haven't been for well, at least well over a year. So Natalie, in your clinical practice, are you seeing a lot of body image, self-esteem issues on the rise right now? Yeah, I am seeing a lot of um, almost hypervigilance related to (sighs) appearance and even personality traits, like people feeling very aware of their language, the words that they're using. There's just like an overall sense of I'm uncomfortable. <laughs> totally. Um, and I, I can honestly attest to it myself too. I have been pretty hibernated here in my house. And the only person I've really had to relate to is like a really four-year-old. close family members. Or my four-year-old. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Your four-year-old. And, and she's pretty forgiving. Like we can do pretty much, you know, whatever we want in front of each other. But I have found, especially with being 100% telehealth throughout COVID, that now that I am, you know, I have one slot, we were talking about this earlier on my caseload, that I do walk and talk sessions. So we're out, we're out in the world, we're out together in person. And um, I have experienced my own, I would almost just call it like gentle awkwardness. I'm very like self-compassionate towards myself when that feeling comes. Um, it's probably because I've been trained to to be able to see myself that way. But I'm hearing from other people, too, that there is a lot of just hypervigilance. People are very aware of themselves in the world, in their relationships. And I'm imagining it's due to the fact that we're coming out of a a season of life where we have had to be hypervigilant for our own physical safety. And this is like a residual byproduct of living in that state for such a long period of time. Well said. And it is so completely all encompassing, right? I mean, you alluded to that in so many different ways. And we had a whole episode on just reintegrating and the discomfort, the awkwardness, the, I like, what'd you call it? The gentle just uh, Awkwardness, gentle, gentle awkwardness. Gentle awkwardness, gentle discomfort. Yeah, I like <laughs> yeah. that. We had a whole episode on that, but I'm really glad that we're here to talk about specifically about weight and body image and, and that too, yeah. because- I think that is, it deserves a whole episode in and of itself. And like Alyssa said, it's it's something that we all, well, a lot of us relate to. Oh, some people yeah. came out like strong though. They were focused. They were exercising this whole time. They were hibernating. They are good to go. And some of us are just not. I know. And, and they scooped up all the workout equipment. I've been <laughs> trying to get it. <laughs> they sure did. They have been committed. It's almost like we're going to a high school reunion every single day. That is an it's excellent, like the pressure. That is an excellent way to put it. Yeah, which is so exhausting, to be honest with you. It's very tiring to feel like we have to uh, almost like perform socially. Uh, it's uncomfortable to hear. I have a lot of compassion towards people. And I think I can take that perspective because I have lived 
pretty much my entire life in a larger body. Uh, I'm even working on sort of changing my stance on the word like fat. There's a lot of stigma around using the word fat. I'm trying to like normalize it. So I think in this podcast, that's kind of the term that I'm going to use when I refer. I either refer to like living in a larger body or living in a fat body. And so I want to bring a lot of my own personal experience to 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 this segment, because I think that it's an expertise that I have that I can help share with others to sort of normalize those feelings of I have to look a certain way to live my life, right? And COVID has also brought us this perspective of we have one life. And so how do we like integrate all of those feelings? Those are some conflicting simultaneous things to experience all at one time. Natalie, um, let's start with your story. Pre-COVID, yeah. pre I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist. Like, yeah. let's go back. Tell take us my about yes. therapist hat off. <laughs> Wait, therapists are human? Like, you have a- <laughs> Let's go yeah. back and hear about the story and the personal experiences that led you to really have this passion to change the language yeah. and change, you know, the stigma. So we're ready. Awesome. So yeah, I'll take my therapist hat off. Let me put my human hat one on. And I want to clarify here for the listeners that I am not like a certified eating disorder specialist. I am talking from my own personally lived experience. Um, I just wanted to like make that that clear that this I'm not specifically trained in eating disorders, but I can definitely share my story. Uh, So I've lived in a larger body my whole life. I was always the chubby tall kid in class, always the one that was told to like stand in the back for class photos because I'm five, eight and a half, like almost hitting five, nine. I come from a family that's very much like large body. So in that sense, in my family, it felt very safe to live in the body that I lived in. It was very normalized within my home. Mm -hmm. Um, But I always felt different out in the world, especially as a kid. I didn't have many other friends that were of the same body type that I was. Um, and I really do think that it it gave me a lot of things, but it also cost me a lot. I think a big portion of my empathy and my ability to put myself in somebody else's shoes is due to the fact that there's a lot of adversity. I'm not sure if that's even the right word, but that's what it felt like is like there were a lot of barriers that I had to go through living in a large body in a world that really values thinness. Mm-hmm. Even just down to like going into um, a restaurant and having to look at the chairs and be like, well, slide into a booth and yeah. Yeah. Like, <laughs> and the beautiful thing about being in your mid thirties is that you don't give a fuck anymore. I go into a <laughs> restaurant now Especially after COVID, it's like I have waited a year and a half to sit my ass in the chair. <laughs> I love it. Well, I actually had that experience recently. I was over at um, the Miramar, which is in Hafen Bay. If you guys have never been over there, it's delicious. They have the yes. best seafood chowder. It's so good. It's good, and I love it. It's like a it's a near and dear place to my my heart and my family's heart. And we were there sort of for this post COVID family reunion, and I we were eating outside, and they have those like horrendous plastic like chairs which I'm like oh my god no this is giving me like PTSD I'm sweating like this is awful we should not be sitting in plastic chairs and me in my 20s even in my early teens would have just like stuck my you know large bottom in that chair and just suffered and I would have been over my plate you know but I I'm really working on advocating and sending this message that it's totally normal to verbalize a need and so I just literally got up out of that chair I looked at it and I said nope and I, I got up <laughs> and I'm watching all of my other family members too kind of like strategically quietly but strategically we're placing the smaller people of my family in the less sturdy chairs and we're offering the like sort of sturdier chairs to the larger body people and I just kind of looked around and I thought fuck this shit I literally drove like an hour and a half to have this meal I'm not going to sit here this whole time and hope I don't bust a limb on this you know plastic crappy chair that they have for me so I saw over in the corner that they had these like sturdier chairs and I just like went over. It was an empty table. I just grabbed it and I switched it out. And never in my life would I have done that before because I would have been so swept up in, oh, somebody's going to say something or the attention. Yes, all don't that draw attention. the, yeah. And you want to know what happened? What happened? All my other, all my other family members went up and did the same thing. It yes. just gave like, <laughs> <laughs> like massive general permission to the whole, you know, crew to say, hey, 
there's nothing wrong with your body. There's something wrong with this chair. And that is a mental perspective that has taken some time um, to switch over to. But man, does it provide like immediate comfort to know that, hey, my body is just different than yours. It doesn't make it wrong or, or inconvenient. Um, I'm, a, I'm a paying customer here. I deserve to like feel comfortable and enjoy my meal just like everybody else. I am so touched right now. Like, I don't even think I've said anything because the beauty of that is so real. And when we talk about, you know what, and I'm looking at Nikki, because I don't know that we've talked a whole lot about privilege on Therapist Uncut yet, but the privileges that come with things, like we don't recognize them. They are a privilege because we don't have to think about them. Mm -hmm. So off camera, guys, we talked a little bit about the privilege that comes with being in a thinner body. And it's fascinating because if you are in a thinner body, you don't always recognize the privilege that might come with that. Just like if you are male, you might not recognize the privilege that comes with that. Or if you are whatever it may be, there's lots of privileges. But can we talk more about that piece that came up in our conversation off camera about the privilege? Yeah. Okay. So my experience with that and the reason why I can speak to the privilege, even though I still live in a larger body, is because I had about a maybe like two or three year span twice in my life where I engaged in really distorted eating. And I had the assistance of medication that allowed me to live and survive off of 800 calories a day, which like trigger warning, that's not healthy. Even if doctors are telling you, Hey, this is, this is fine. We're monitoring your vitals. Everything is good. Um, nobody deserves to live on 800 calories a day for for any reason at all, but it, it resulted in massive weight loss for me because I was in sort of a dark, you know, mental health. I was coming out of a, a breakup. I was in like 19, 20 years old. I didn't have, like, that was all I cared about is I just wanted to look good. I wanted to have that like post breakup. Look like, good yeah. per mm-hmm. societal standards, right? Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> Right. And I got that, y'all. I saw my ex, his mouth dropped, and it was, you know, <laughs> cleanly, um, <laughs> right. But it didn't fix any of what I was actually searching for. But I did get a taste of what it felt like to live as a skinny person. And that experience, actually, it was more like an experiment, was fascinating <laughs> because... <laughs> Your choice of words is so spot on. It's fantastic. (laughs) Because people are really nice to skinny people. Um, Before, when I was in a larger body, and even now, you get a lot of compliments of like, oh, your face is so pretty. Or you have, I would always get like, oh, you have beautiful eyes. And I get, I get it. I get it. Like, this is not um, to have like, you know, ill will towards anybody who's ever said that to me but on the receiving end it always felt like well, what the fuck like what like, what about like the 90 percent rest of me like that's not worth complimenting or drawing positive attention to um or even just not focusing on any of my physical features and talking about how I make you feel or you know hey I feel super safe around you or you're really funny or whatever it may be um so in that sense like I just I felt there was so much attention. And especially when you're losing weight that rapidly, everybody assumes that it's healthy. So I would get that a lot too. There was this like reinforcement of like, good for you. You look so great. And now I have learned, like um, I saw something on the internet recently that said like, I'm so sorry for it. If I ever reinforced someone's eating disorder by complimenting weight loss. And that really hit home for me Mm -hmm. because I definitely Huge. identified that season of my life as like I had a full on eating disorder because it was, you know, I had this medication that just never made me hungry. I'm living off of like two sausage links and like three cups of coffee. Like that's not good for your body. And it wasn't honoring my body in or any your way, mind. but it was right. No, I mean, not just mm, yeah. No. No, and I y- y'all, I still have like heart palpitations from taking that medication. Like it's very concerning. That even with a whole medical team, I worked with mm-hmm. my doctor who recommended this program to me, who monitored my vitals. And okay, so yes, blood pressure was okay, but I was ragey. I and I was just so small. And that was my only focus was how do I look? And it was never enough. That's another thing with weight loss, is like mm-hmm. you would meet your first goal. Cool, yay! Like, you know, and oh, then you I look lost- in the mirror and it's like, okay, yeah, that's that's not 
cutting it for me. Nope. More. Mm -hmm. It's that addictive piece of weight loss. Right. And I actually reached a certain weight that still had me like, you know, on the BMI index, like as obese, but I looked, I look back at photos of that girl and I just think, Oh my God, like somebody help her. I was so like emaciated. I was still over 200 pounds, you guys. So if a doctor saw me, they'd be like, Oh, keep going. Like, I think they told me my goal weight was like, 160 for your height what are you mm-hmm. again like five eight I was five eight and a half I am five eight and a half yeah it was the wow. I want to say yeah I want to say it was I don't know why that number is sticking out but I want to say it was like 160 to be not considered obese right or oh, overweight geez. yeah and I just thought that would have killed me if I kept going that would have killed me and thank god I could no longer afford this program so I had to stop because I was I think I was preparing to go into graduate school so there had to be like a reconstructing of priority of money and I mean, that saved my life. Like I, of course, gained weight after like, hello, (laughs) we don't have this like magic pill. Um, That really should have only been taken in short periods of time. And I was on it for over two years, you guys, again, with like medical guidance, like people. And how scary is that? Mm -hmm. Because you know, it wasn't just your experience. Mm -hmm. No. What would have been helpful for you to hear and from whom during that time in your life? Gosh, that's a really good question. I was even in therapy, but I don't think I was bringing this to the table. And I don't think my therapist was necessarily trained in like looking at it from that distorted eating lens. I think I was with a therapist who I appreciated dearly and helped me in so many other ways. Um, But there, there was not this conversation happening of like, how are you really? And what's your relationship like with food? And it's interesting that now at, you know, I've gained well over like a hundred pounds since doing that. I have a healthier relationship with food now than I ever did when I was thin, but I don't get any of the credit because I live in a larger body. So people automatically look at me and go, or I'm assuming that there's this association of like, Oh, you must have like an eating problem, but that's not the case anymore. Cause I dealt with my shit. Um, <laughs> and so I think that's a frustrating piece too, of there's a lot of privilege just in that, assuming that thin people are healthy. I, guys, I'm so ADD. If you're watching me, I'm like, uh, uh, uh. <laughs> so I'm trying to focus without interrupting. Thank you, Nikki. Nikki gets me. Two things I came up. <laughs> you might be the, the interrupter, but I'm just the tangential swirler. So <laughs> <laughs> that's what you get when y'all tune in. All right. Number one, just very quickly or briefly, I would love if you can speak all, more on your statement of I had a therapist, but I wasn't really bringing this to the table. And two, mm-hmm the significance, the the such high importance of having a therapist that specializes in the needs that you have. And I want to insert myself here really quick too, because we've been talking from the human hat, but put yourself back in the therapist chair for a second. Even if your client brings that to the table, if they don't fully bring it to the table and it's more of a comment about how you're working with your medical team to lose this weight, I'm I'm going to be honest. If I hear somebody mentioning in in treatment with a doctor, I'm not going to be inclined to think that that's something that could be (laughs) going south. Right. I mean, we're trusting Mm -hmm. other professionals to, to be professional and to Mm -hmm. to be making healthy choices for our clients. And then one last human, human hat, because Natalie has, has done a fantastic job of putting on the human hat today. You'd mentioned that people automatically assume, right? Skinny equals healthy. I'm going to speak to that. I had a period in high school where I was severely underweight. I I had a medical issue going on. I was sick. I could not keep food down. And I was so unhealthy. I was sick all the time. But in society standards, I could walk into Hollister or Abercrombie or whatever, right? And all the clothes fit me. Yeah, double zero, mm-hmm. zero, whatever it is. Um, the attention, like you were talking about, Natalie. But I was so ill. So ill. I mean, that sounds yeah. dramatic. I was not dying or, or like deathly ill, but no, I did but, not feel well. And I was even not that, healthy. Even that, like assuming that weight loss is is solely related to like dieting right? Mm -hmm. Restrictive eating, that it's not because somebody could um, have cancer or be sick or, you know, be going through some other gastrointestinal issues. Who who was that? Was that the Black Panther actor that was the one that was, he had, um, I'm rambling. He passed away (laughs) of of some type of cancer, but there was so much emphasis. 
Yes, there, and there yeah. was so much emphasis on his weight loss, right? And and so much criticism, and it was he wasn't disclosing to the public why he was he losing was, weight, right? Right, yeah. and so I, I can see both sides, but yes, I'm definitely speaking through the the human experience because I want to send this message of like, and I don't even know if I even really have the words for it, guys, because I can still I can still feel that pull to be thinner. I definitely have mornings I wake up in my own body now and I'm like, oh, yeah, we should, you know whatever, we should start that keto diet again, or we should, you know, which like no disrespect to anybody who's still in that world. And I think it's about educating oh. yourself. Yeah. And, and educating right. yourself on who benefits from me thinking that way. And I think that was actually Signa Darpinian. And my God, if she's listening, she changed my world when she did her presentation at CHS. I was so angry after. So, so Signa is a certified eating disorder specialist. She has a practice in a local hero. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I have such a girl crush on her. I just love her. <laughs> and um, so she did a presentation on eating disorders at Center for Human Services, which is like where we've all, you know, we were all born out of, right? And so I remember sitting there as the clinician. I was in my clinician hat, um, but also bringing in my human part to this training. And I remember being so freaking angry with the stuff she was sharing. Cause I was, I think I was doing keto at the time. And she just like, <laughs> if you've ever been with Signa, like she just like, like lights like the the diet industry like on fire like right in front of you and you're just seeing like <laughs> like your whole world that you you know I felt like my foundation was just like completely crumbled underneath me and it elicited <laughs> anger right I was like, this shit? and that's like that you don't know that says right we have to analyze that why does that make us so angry when somebody oh, blows that up yeah. everything everything into that world if that wasn't my answer then where the fuck am I Mm -hmm. Like that had to be my answer. Diet culture had to be my answer at that moment in time for me. And I'm so thankful now because I have such a healthier relationship with my own body and with sort of like the world at large. And it really stemmed in that moment. And it took a lot of hard processing um, because I was actually next to a girlfriend of mine and we were both in similar like life, you know, stages and, and similar body types. And we both left like that shit what does she know like, he's like, uh, you know uh, <laughs> like but I didn't know then what I know now and once I let that anger dissipate and I really did get to the heart of like why is this so upsetting to me it was because I had placed all of my identity in being thin and I had forgotten that like what if my genetics just like aren't gonna allow for that <laughs> like genetics Right? What? Like, we don't talk about that piece of not a lot of people in my family gene pool are thin. And even if they're smaller, they're not thin. Right. Like, we're just not necessarily made that way. Yeah. And a um, lot of it comes back from the assumptions that we make as humans on other people, right? We talk about not being judgmental, but we have our own biases and we have to control them. There's mm -hmm. just so many assumptions that are made about a person based on their experience, their weight, their hair color, their gender, their size all of that that comes with it so if you are listening the challenge that i am going to give you for this episode is truly recognize the assumptions that you are making about somebody based on what you see without having any evidence and be kind just be kind guys that's what we always ask no. be and this, to be kind and this is not just apply i know you know in your practice alley you work specifically with women's issues but this is not a gender specific issue right this not is a no. cross gender so i mean age bracket age span generate it's it's everybody yeah it is everybody i have a five-year-old and i to this day it boggles my mind and broke my heart because it is summertime and my daughter is five and she has a tankini bathing suit so for those of you who don't know a tankini is a two-piece but it's not a bikini. It's like a, it's like a top. That's kind of, it shows like maybe. I don't know why, but your description <laughs> of this is cracking. <laughs> it's, like, it's a tankini because it shows like maybe two inches of her belly. And that was the only bathing suit we had. I was like, this one's over here. And this one's at Abuela. Like, this is what we got. And she wouldn't put it on. And I said, help me understand what's happening. This is all we have. We got to go to the lake. Let's go. Right. And I had to slow down. And she said, well, if I wear that, won't people make fun of me? And I was like, who the told you that? I'm hella mad, right? <laughs> so I'm like, what are we watching? Who's what, what friends are you around? I'm super angry because I'm like, you are five. And I feel like I am sheltering you quite a bit. But, you know, her dad and I, yet she still has this understanding that if I wear less clothes or if I wear a bikini or show my belly, that I'm at risk of being made fun of by my other five-year-old friends. 
And that was heartbreaking. Language is so important. I just had a moment that sort of gave me some hope with Rosie. Cause I do, I think being a mother of a daughter, it's at least for me, it's like that primary, like I want her above all else to love and honor and respect her body and her whole being, but like specifically her body, because I know as women, there's so much emphasis on how we look and bodies and being small. Right. And so I'm very, very specific with the language in which I use. And it comes out like of the mouth of babes. I would have the same interaction with her. I'd be like, where the hell did you learn that? I know I didn't, that didn't come from me, you know, but there are other ways that they- And then you like got to pause, right? right? Like I got to pause. Uh, this to, is like, a learning moment. How do we redirect? Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah, and it's funny because you can mom. always watch the steam coming out of the mall, uh, right? So, I mean, my family, we were at dinner the other night, same thing. I mean, ours yeah. is 12, not five, but- She's sitting at the table and headed to orientation. And she made a comment about having a salad, which, I mean, the kid loves salad. She's abnormal. But um, so it was not out of the ordinary for her to order a salad. But then she made a comment about Mm -hmm. connecting the salad with this upcoming orientation. And I could just see, same thing, that, right? Steam's coming out of my wife's ears as she takes a breath, Mm -hmm. as she plans how she's going to handle this learning experience. And also Mm -hmm. is just pissed that the world would put this into a kid's mind for sure yeah. and, and a kid is absolutely correct because it's not a young lady's mind or a girl's mind it's across the entire gender spectrum absolutely. whatever gender you identify with there are so <clears throat> many body image issues that come with all of us as human beings and it's going to take so much work for us to have this forward progress there's a lot of focus that sometimes we spend on female mental health or how things impact like moms and, and dads and, and guys and other genders they get left out like, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but it's really happening across the world. We all have that experience of who shrunk all my clothes? Why is this shirt not fitting? Did you put this in the dryer? <laughs> yeah, babe. I, I shrunk every single one of your clothes and I'm sorry. <laughs> and now we go to the store and I can't fathom like having to buy a size or two sizes up because it's a struggle. Mm-hmm. I, Natalie, I know I truly appreciate this topic. Our listeners I very much going to appreciate you being vulnerable enough today to yeah. share such a dark part, but also healing and forward movement part of your life, because you are giving people permission to acknowledge like there yeah. is something that's not right with this and we need to do something to change it. Yes. And if that's the headspace that you're in, any listeners in here of like my clothes are too tight, fuck this shit. I'm not going to go to work or go to see that friend because, you know, I'm a little bit softer than I was a year and a half. Go buy some new fucking clothes. <laughs> mm-hmm. I'm not even kidding you. Hell yes. Buy clothes that fit your body and that honor you and you will see that narrative change. There may still be some residual feelings about being in a larger body or a body that looks different than last year, but th- it changes when we dress in a way that honors who we are right now. If you got a box of skinny clothes in your garage and you're thinking, okay, We're going to just toss them, donate them to somebody else who they can serve now in this moment. We don't need to hang on to things that keep us stuck and frozen in a past state. We need to be more present in the body that we live in now so that we can live our life right now. Fully. Can you remind us of the mantra that you uh, say to your daughter or what you had just said? Oh, yeah. I I always tell her she she she's in that stage, too, of like, are people going to think I'm cute? Are they going to think I'm pretty? And it's like, I want to like bite my tongue. So I always ask her, do you feel cute or pretty? Or do you like the skirt that you're wearing? I try to give it back to her so she feels a sense of empowerment. Mm -hmm. Um, And then I also try to follow it up with like, you know what makes you cute is that you have a really good heart, that your heart is beautiful. But I had this moment with her where um, I'm a, I'm a pear shape y'all. So I got, I got a, I got a little behind on me and um my daughter has this tiny little stool in her bathroom that she makes me sit on when she's using and she for the longest time would be like your butt's too big and I would say the stool is is too small too small I said there is nothing (laughs) nothing nothing wrong with mom's butt and then I always follow it up with all bodies are good bodies and we recently had um, a family member over and she's around the age of nine and we were talking about bodies or whatever. There are different stages developmentally, obviously. I feel like when I'm around kids, there's a lot of emphasis on the way that I look and they have a lot of questions and there's usually like, do you have a baby in your belly? And I feel like if I answer it very neutrally and also model love for my body of like, nope, this is, I think I usually say like, nope, that's just my lunch. <laughs> <laughs> yep, exactly. So it's my yeah, burrito, baby. That's yes. my answer. It's my burrito, like, baby. <laughs> I'm not going to be offended. And I think that's what people who do 
do live in larger bodies can do for other people too, is like neutralizing and normalizing when a child makes a comment about your body to not close that door of conversation off, but to really normalize it in that moment. And I heard my daughter the other day, because the nine-year-old said something that sounded kind of maybe critical to her own body or to mine. I can't remember what the scenario was. And then I heard Rosie say, but mama, all bodies are good bodies. And I just like, oh, hmm. I'm done. You know, mission, it was that moment of like, like, all right, it's sinking awesome. in. And I really hope that it stays. And I think by just changing our language and the words that we use to describe our bodies and the bodies that our kids see, that that can open the door of, hey, all bodies look different, but all bodies are really, really good bodies. I love it. Mm-hmm. So, Natalie, I kind of just want to let that rest, right? I but know. It's, and, and we've focused mostly on weight today, but it's, it's all encompassing, right? Mm-hmm. My boobs are too big. My boobs are too small for guys, right? There is this pressure to have muscles that genetically speaking are not attainable for a large majority of guys. Right. Sure. Um, my, my feet are too big. I, I don't know. Pick my it, calves, it. my body hair, my, my hairline. Like there's so much about our body that we pick on. Totally. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I'm going to throw myself under. I am in my thirties and acne apparently does not go away in my family. <laughs> right. And you grow up hearing, oh, just wait, you know, just wait when you're an adult, when you're okay. I've been an adult for a while now and hello. <laughs> so that's another aspect of COVID, right? I have kind of enjoyed, let's be real. I have kind of enjoyed ha- being able to wear a mask out in public because it hides my breakouts <laughs> it's a thing mm-hmm. man and this is all encompassing so mm-hmm. if you're listening to this and you're identifying with it um guy girl short tall 20 80 it doesn't matter it's a human experience and so if you identify with this be nice to yourself be kind to yourself because let's be real most of us at some point have struggled with some form of this body image um self-criticism and for me, it's it's really about refocusing on how, how am I healthy, mm-hmm. right? At what state am I healthy? And learning to be okay with and appreciate the me that is healthy. Because mm-hmm. that's what it's all about. And that's how I personally have managed and balanced all of the different pressures. But yeah. if you're listening to this, I think it's a focus. It's a reset on how can I be healthy within this? Yeah, shifting that motivation piece, right? Like, what is motivating me right now? Is it vanity or is it like health and well being? Mm-hmm. Like, those are all such good points to remember. Natalie, you touched on so much today that, like I said, we truly appreciate your vulnerability and your willingness to share. If mm-hmm. our listeners took one thing from today, what would you want them to take? Be gentle with yourself. And to remember that you deserve to take up space in this world, that we don't always have to be on this hamster wheel of shrinking ourselves to be pleasing to other people. And Natalie, if our listeners would like to connect with you, where can they find you? Yes, I share a lot of um, body positive content over on my Instagram, and that's at natalie.silva.lmst. We love Natalie's social media. She's always spot on. Your content is very appreciated. Thank you. Yeah. And I would love to send, you know, there's so many things that I'm being flooded with right now. Like there's a podcast for, I think it's called like Two Fat Chicks Dating. And it's all about dating while fat. And there's one that's um, plus size travel, because I know that that can be a pain point for people in larger bodies. Um, And then there's another girl, Katie McCrenshaw, she she wrote the the children's book Her Body Can, and it's a fabulous children's book. I love it. And Rosie and I, I we our listeners time, so. love resources. So guys, yeah, if you would yeah, like yeah. to check out resources mentioned on this episode, please go to therapistuncut.com to our show notes page. We will make sure that everything is posted there for you guys. Thanks for coming back, Natalie. We always enjoy having you. And I'm warning you now. If it's up to us, you'll be back again. So <laughs> be <in>. prepared. <laughs> Absolutely. Right. Thank you for allowing us into your life and helping us make mental health relatable and a part of your everyday conversation. And if you have not yet, please subscribe. Subscribe to the podcast. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. Stay connected, guys. We love doing this and we hope this is helpful for you. We'll see you next time. See you guys. 
Thank you for joining Therapist Uncut, a production of AMP Smart Business. To learn more about Therapist Uncut and stay up on upcoming episodes, please subscribe and follow us on social media. As a reminder, although the Therapist Uncut co-hosts are licensed therapists, they are not your therapist. This podcast is not intended to substitute professional mental health counseling. If you need professional therapy, please contact your local provider or primary care provider. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you on the next episode of Therapist Uncut.